lives precariously and at discretion. Now, I think it's a very useful contrast that we can set up between Fletcher's explanation of how free people defend themselves and slaves depend upon others for their defense to contrast that from Bill Clinton's endorsement of the idea that the American population is the property of the central government and must be protected by the central government. On February 28th of 1995, Bill Clinton said the following, quote, a crucial part of our job here in Washington is to help arm the American people through our police officers to fight crime and violence, close quote. In other words, we're not freemen, but slaves dependent upon the government for our defense. William Blackstone, the properly celebrated English jurist whose commentaries on the law were very influential in our founding and among the most widely read documents by our founding fathers, wrote that the right of the people of having arms for their own defense is a ne necessary function of, quote, the natural right of resistance and self-preservation when the sanctions of society and laws are found insufficient to restrain the violence of oppression, close quote. Now it's important to recognize that Blackstone, like so many others among this pool of scholars, talked about the right to keep and bear arms as a necessary ingredient not only of armed defense against criminals in the private realm, but also against the oppression of government, criminals who act under the color of government authority. Now, one critical way in which our Founding Fathers expanded upon this ancient Anglo-Saxon doctrine of liberty was by dispensing with the key limitation on the right to keep and bear arms. Many English theorists, Blackstone among them, referred to a right to bear arms as provided by law. The American Founders, by way of contrast, specified that this right could not be infringed by law. That's a very important distinction, and that is, to the best of my knowledge, a uniquely American concept that the right to keep and bear arms, like the right to speak freely, to express your opinions, to petition the government for grievances, these are God-given rights not subject to infringement by law. We could review very briefly how some of the American framers looked upon the right to keep and bear arms in the context of a free society and a free state. Alexander Hamilton, in Federalist Essay Number 29, addressed concerns about the emergence of a standing army in our country by assuring his readers, bear in mind this is a brief that Hamilton and Madison and Jay were writing on behalf of ratification of the Constitution. Hamilton assured his readers that such an army, quote, can never be formidable to the liberties of the people while there is a large body of citizens, little if at all inferior to them in discipline and the use of arms, who stand ready to defend their rights and those of their fellow citizens, close quote. James Madison in the 46th Federalist Essay is properly remembered for explicitly referring to the well-regulated militia, meaning once again the people at large under arms, as the ultimate check upon a corrupted and tyrannical central government. Madison specifically referred in that Federalist essay to, quote, the advantage of being armed which the Americans possess over the people of almost every other nation, close quote. A lesser known but very important Federalist political advocate by the name of Tench Cox explained in his essay, An American Citizen, that if tyranny should emerge, quote, friends of liberty, using those arms which providence has put into their hands, will make a solemn appeal to the power above. And in a subsequent essay, Cox celebrated the fact that, quote, the powers of the sword are in the hands of the yeomanry of America from 16 to 60, the unlimited power of the sword is not in the hands of either the federal or state governments, but where I trust God, it will ever remain in the hands of the people." Close quote. Now there is simply no academically respectable case to be made for the proposition that the right protected by the Second Amendment is a collective right to be exercised by the government in the interests of protecting us. One very useful admission against interest in this respect comes from left-wing academic Daniel Lazari, who is an outspoken advocate of overthrowing our constitutional order altogether and enacting a new constitution that's more statist in its outlook. In a 1999 Harper's Magazine essay, Daniel Lazari wrote the following, quote, the truth about the Second Amendment is something that liberals cannot bear to admit. The right wing is right. 
The amendment does confer an individual right to bear arms, and its very presence makes effective gun control in this country all but impossible, close quote. I would amend that statement only by saying that the Second Amendment does not confer anything. It simply protects a pre-existing right that is natural and innate in human beings as the result of being made in the image of our Creator. To continue from Daniel Lazari's essay, quote, It is now apparent that the amendment, the Second Amendment, despite its brevity, encapsulates an entire worldview concerning the nature of political power, the rights and duties of citizenship, and the relationship between the individual and the state. It is virtually a constitution within the Constitution, which is undoubtedly why it fuels such fierce passions. Close quote. Once again, the worldview encapsulated in the Second Amendment, in which the Constitution elaborates at necessary length, is that the government does not have a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. It cannot have a monopoly on the legitimate use of force, being the creation of individuals who have delegated a portion of their God-given power to the Constitution to, pr to protect their God-given rights. Now, where the contrary proposition has prevailed, and government has been seen as an entity with a monopoly on the use of force, the result has been almost unfathomable bloodshed and horror. One of the best critiques of the idea that gun control or civilian disarmament brings peace and safety is to be found in a statement made in 1941 by Congressman Edwin Arthur Hall, who was opposing a proposition made at the time by the FDR administration that a national gun control, or forgive me, a national gun registration act be passed and implemented in our country. This is what Representative Hall had to say about that proposal. Quote, before the advent of Hitler or Stalin, who took power from the German and Russian peoples, measures were thrust upon the free legislatures of those countries to deprive the people of the possession and use of firearms, so that they could not resist the encroachments of such diabolical state police organizations as the Gestapo, the OGPU, and the Cheka, close quote. The OGPU and the Cheka were Soviet secret police organizations, and we'll talk about their contribution to the sorry history of civilian disarmament in a second. But one of the things that is largely misunderstood by the public, and very important that the public educate itself about, is the fact that gun control in the 20th century, once again, I would prefer to call it civilian disarmament in the 20th century, has been a necessary precondition for genocide. There's a very good group by the name of Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership that compiled this study, Lethal Laws, Gun Control is the Key to Genocide. What they have done is they have taken a study of all of the major episodes of genocide in the 20th century and shown how in each country where this has happened, a necessary precursor for this tragedy has been a civilian disarmament measure. Often that civilian disarmament measure was one that a totalitarian government inherited from a predecessor regime. Often these measures have been enacted by a totalitarian government in the interest of disarming its potential civilian opposition. Just a very brief review of how this process has worked in terms of the numbers. In the Soviet Union, between 1929 and 1953, at least 20 million and probably as many as 30 or 40 million people were killed by the government largely as a result of the fact that they were disarmed by a government that had a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. In Nazi Germany and occupied Europe, between 1933 and 1945, we saw 13 million people killed. This excludes battlefield casualties. In China, from 1949 to 1976, another 20 million people, that is once again pretty much a bottom end estimate, were killed by a government that had enacted, or that had built upon an existing gun control law. In Uganda, from 1971 to 1979, you had 300,000 people killed following a gun control or gun registration act. Cambodia, from 1975 to 1979, you had at least one million and perhaps as many as three million people who were killed in a nation where the totalitarian regime had enacted a gun control law. The most recent genocide studied by Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership was the 1994 genocide, as referred to the Otto Genocide in Rwanda. It began on the 7th of April of 1994 and ended on the 19th of July. Some 800,000 Rwandans were slaughtered by the regime in just 103 days. It's one of the 
most rapid and, and garish bloodlettings of which we have record. Not many people appreciate the fact that there were two types of registration that uh, were the precursors for the Rwandan genocide. The first was a uh, gun registration act that was passed in 1974 and was later firmed up into a gun control act in uh, 1979 that prevented civilians from buying firearms for their own defense. And the other was a national identity card registration act and that identity card contained the ethnicity of the person who held that card. That came in very handy when the regime decided that the Tutsi population must be massacred uh, out of a sense of ethnic grievance by the dominant Hutu regime. And that's why you had 800,000 Rwandans, many of them hacked to death with machetes, slaughtered by a government after they had been disarmed and left helpless. And the really interesting thing about that particular genocide is that the United Nations had a peacekeeping mission in Rwanda at the time that was informed of the fact that the genocide had been planned. And rather than acting several months before the genocide to preempt it, uh, the powers that be at UN headquarters in New York City decided that the United Nations peacekeepers should remain aloof from this matter. And as, as it happens, they presided over a mission that has become notorious now and is now cited as the supposed uh, proof of uh, the need for a more vigorous UN military enforcement arm. Uh, they did nothing to prevent the genocide. They did nothing to disarm the government as uh, the government prepared to kill hundreds of thousands of its disarmed subjects. And that once again is what happens when people trust in promises of peace and safety from those who would disarm them. Now the prototype for the process of genocide, I believe, and it could be, it, that process could be summarized as follows. Disarmament, disenfranchisement, that is to say you're no longer allowed to participate in politics, dehumanization, and then destruction. The prototype for this process was, was the Soviet regime's purge and liquidation of its internal enemies. That began right after the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution. A Soviet decree issued on August 31st of 1918 said the following, quote, anyone caught in illegal possession of a firearm will be immediately executed. Gun collections and seizures commenced immediately in the Soviet secret police, which at the time was called the Cheka, dispatched spies that honeycombed every social institution in search of socially dangerous elements, or what are now called extremists in contemporary parlance. Those socially dangerous elements were those who resisted civilian disarmament. The Soviet regime conducted a particularly brutal disarmament campaign against the Cossacks of the Don River region. And that illustrates, I think, how disarmament leads inevitably to tyranny and eventually to genocide. There's a very valuable study that came out in 1998 entitled The Black Book of Communism. In The Black Book of Communism, the authors, drawing upon archival materials recently made available from the Soviet Union, uh, describe how the Cossacks were the subject of a campaign that eerily prefigures the Nazi campaign against the Jews. According to the Black Book of Communism, the Cossacks were ordered on pain of death to surrender all their arms. Historically, as the traditional frontier soldiers of the Russian Empire, all Cossacks had a right to bear arms, and all Cossack administrative assemblies were immediately dissolved. So you have dis disarmament and then disenfranchisement. Prior to the disarmament initiative, the Bolshevik government had planned to exterminate the Cossacks entirely. A secret Soviet resolution of January 24, 1919 decreed, quote, We must recognize as the only politically correct measure massive terror and a merciless fight against the rich Cossacks who must be exterminated and physically disposed of down to the last man, close quote. In predictable fashion, the Cossacks were rounded up by the secret police and herded into camps that foreshadowed once again in breathtaking and terrifying detail the extermination camps of Nazi-occupied Europe. Martin Latsis, who was the head of the Soviet secret police in Ukraine, described how Cossacks under his jurisdiction, quote, are dying like flies. General Tukhachevsky, who was commissioned